Hey guys, you're watching RPAD TV. I'm Raymond, your host, and it is May, which is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Throughout May, I'm going to be talking about really important Asian Americans in video games and music, pro wrestling, and more. Today, I have the honor of speaking with my childhood hero, Dean Takahashi. If you're not familiar with Dean, and really, if you follow the video game business, you should know who this man is, because he is the video game journalist. He is the gold standard. He has written for the Wall Street Journal, Red Herring, San Jose Mercury News, and I believe for more than a decade, he's been at Venture Beat. Basically, he's just been doing this longer and better than anyone I could think of. And for thousands of people in the video game business, he is the man. So enough about me talking. Let's bring Dean in. Dean, how are you doing today? Uh, good. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, thank you for being here. It's uh, tremendously honored that you're spending some time. And it's really important. I really, you were one of the first people I thought of for Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. I mean, a lot of people in the business know who you are. And I think everyone around the world should know who you are because you are awesome, sir. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's an honor for me to be here too. Fantastic. Now, if I did my homework correctly, you got your bachelor's in English and your master's in journalism. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I went to the uh, University of California at Berkeley, and um, they they had an English major. They didn't have a journalism undergrad major. Um, oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I I didn't have the easiest time deciding uh, exactly what to do because I was a I was a pretty good Asian uh, uh, American <laughs> student there. Right. And, uh, was uh, you know. As, well, probably not bad at math and, and science, but uh, uh, I, I tried out uh, all of the prerequisites for for the uh, business school. And oh, thought about uh, uh, doing that, and I did that for a couple of years, but ba basically decided that like I just loved all of the English and history classes I was taking better, and so uh, by then. You know, the time I was forced to declare a major, um, I, I chose English, and they also didn't even have a journalism undergrad degree. Right. Degree, so, um, so that was sort of the best option. But, but yeah, journalism was what I had in mind pretty much by the the end of this the sophomore year. Um, what were some of the influences that pushed you towards journalism? Was there was there journalists that you looked up to, or any articles you read that made you? want to pursue this career? Well, growing up when I did, um, Watergate was a big deal. And, ah. uh, you know, the, the Washington Post, uh, you know, uh, Woodward and Bernstein uh, reporters, they, you know, they, they got famous uh, for all the president's men and, and basically right. bring, bringing down Richard Nixon. Right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it felt like a, you know, a, a rewarding sort of service oriented career where you could, you could accomplish good things and, and do, do you know make the world seem right I, I wasn't always the most outgoing person either uh and you know i was uh, a shyer person you know i remembered even in college i was giving like oral reports and my hand would shake right <laughs> i was so nervous right uh, talking to people um but right you know writing and reading always came very naturally to me so the, the writing uh -huh. part um you know, sort of made it a lot more uh, interesting to, for, for me to you know, consider going into, into journalism or writing for a living. I didn't realize this, that you would have to talk to so many people. <laughs> <laughs> so I was a little naive about that, but still uh, eventually got over the shyness part. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, it still comes back sometimes, but I think I've learned some tricks uh, to how to sort of Yes. Yeah. I remember at GameSpy, I used to yeah. refer to you as Dancing Dean Takahashi and make up stories about you just killing it on the dance floor at events like Dice. <laughs> this, this is all true, by the way. If you've never seen Dean dance, you're, you should check it out. <laughs> you're in for a treat. Now, getting back to journalism in English, um, those aren't typical majors for Asian Americans mm -hmm. um, from your generation and, and maybe up until fairly recently, did was there any pressure at home 
about studying these kinds of things instead of the traditional, you know, doctor, engineer. Um, uh, even. I, yeah, I felt I felt like I put pressure on myself to go and, and fully explore those things, uh, you know, like go into check out engineering, check out business. But but grades in, in probably math and physics uh, probably brought me down a notch there. <laughs> so, <laughs> gotcha. Uh, it didn't go as, as well as uh, I, I hoped on that front. Um, and uh, my my father, I had you know I, I did have a conversation with my my dad about it. And, um, he 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 had his own personal history of going into accounting and uh, uh, business management uh, for uh, the state of California, and um, he really wanted to um, study history and be like a history teacher. Right. He regretted not doing that. And he basically told me that you should just do what you want because that's going to make you happy. So which was, was a very unusual answer to get from an Asian father, right? Especially <laughs> at, at that time, very yeah. much so. Yeah, that's that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, so, so well, and that, yeah, it worked out well. I am I am grateful for, for him. Mm -hmm. So you've been doing this since um, the 80s? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, a long time. Uh, I graduated from Berkeley in 86. Uh, I went and got that extra master's degree in journalism from Northwestern. Right. And that was just a one year program. And, uh, uh, you know, it sort of cemented the notion that I, I really liked doing uh, this kind of work. Uh, I got my first job in uh, uh, Dallas at the Dallas Times Herald newspaper. And uh, the first week I was on the job, it was near Christmas. And, uh, I had I was assigned to cover a triple murder on Christmas Eve <laughs> that year. Wow. Just one week out of job, I'm going like, "Wow, do I really have to go and <laughs> knock on the doors of the neighbors to find out uh, more about what happened here?" <laughs> like, you know, like, yeah, I was supposed to do that, and so, um, uh, the, you know, it was it was not a fun experience by, by I mean, not not at all what I was preparing for. I think. Right, and then they were downsizing uh, a few months later, and then they put me into the business section. Uh, oh, of wow. the newspaper, and I was going, Oh, well, you know, this can't be so bad <laughs> uh, com by comparison. Yes, um, the em emotionally wrenching experiences are going to be a lot easier to take in, in business, I think. Than yeah, a few sure. less homicides, yeah. <laughs> in that area. So, so what were some of those? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. those interviews that you you had to mm -hmm. do like knock knock merry christmas uh can you tell me what happened over, over there that seems so bizarre yeah yeah i mean one of the fun ones i had was uh to just go visit a a place that was open for 24 hours and go hang out there and mm. see what happened and uh and so i went to a diner and uh just started you know talking to the people there the, the waitresses and you know they they just told me funny stories about the things that happen in the middle of the night in a place like that. And, you know, there's um, one guy who had this story. It's like, well, it, the, the evening got interesting when somebody came in the door and yelled, there's a naked woman out there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that was just a, a fun kind of story uh, when I was starting out. And, gotcha. Yeah. So You've been, as I said in the intro, you've been covering video games, in my opinion, longer and better than anyone. What are some of the major changes you've seen in the way video games are covered? I mean, we've gone through the print, internet, and now I guess we're almost in the influencer era now where a lot of young people get their information that way. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it is totally different. I mean, um, I, I think it was always uh, difficult to convince the mainstream media that they needed to cover games right uh, and they they always covered games in in some sort of uh lim limited fashion and that's kind of how i started I, i've been doing it 27 years as a as a like a daily or weekly beat and uh games um was something they gave me at the wall street journal in the san francisco office uh because i was the youngest guy in the office and i was the only one uh -huh. who played games really and uh, <laughs> And that, you know, we're supposed to cover the entire sort of West uh, Coast, really. And so I had companies like Nintendo and, uh, and Sony, uh, Microsoft uh, in, in 
electronic arts in, in that area. And so, right. um, you know, bigger companies, uh, I, I had to go and, and cover what they did in games. And uh, I had already done a, a bit of reporting earlier in uh, Los Angeles and Orange County, where I covered companies like uh, um, Interplay, which was Brian right. Fargo's company. <laughs> and, uh, and it's interesting that Brian is still in the industry today. Yeah. Uh, so also wrote the first very first story on um, Blizzard uh, when they were known as Chaos Studios. And uh, they sold uh, their company to Davidson uh, back in the day for an astounding $7 million. <laughs> Here are these 20 something year old guys uh, who just got totally rich uh, selling their company for seven million bucks. Right? Uh, so, yeah, it was it was fun. Uh, at at the journal, um, uh, I stayed a few years and uh, eventually um, hopped onto the story on some tips about Microsoft being interested in making its own game console. Uh, you know, the Xbox, and um, uh, I think I, I wrote the second story on that. Uh, uh, Tom over at Next Generation, Tom Russo, beat me on that story, uh, but he just said they were, they were thinking about doing it, and then when I wrote my follow-up story, um, I wrote how they were prepared to spend billions of dollars on it. Um, they were making a, a big, uh, big effort on it. So, so that was fun, and that turned into a book. On yes. The Xbox. <laughs> opening the Xbox. Opening the Xbox. Uh, and that one came out in 2002, right after the, uh, the successful launch of the Xbox. And then I did another one on the Xbox 360, um, the Xbox 360 Uncloaked, and that was out in 2006. I actually have both of those. I should really get you to sign them. I, I've never <laughs> thought, I don't know why I haven't. That's weird. So a lot of the people that, that worked the newspaper beat covering video games early on, like um, Chip Carter, Steve Kent, mm -hmm. they're, they're not, they haven't been doing this for a long time, but you're still going. What, what motivates you to keep covering this business? Well, um, I think I, I figured out um, at a certain point that uh, being self-directed uh, as a journalist uh, was important, uh, especially on something that had to do with just judging how important something was, right? And um, at, at a newspaper, you always have editors that you're reporting into. It's, it's a very hierarchical structure where the reporters are sort of at the bottom of the, the, the rungs, the bottom of the ladder, editors above them, uh, front page editors uh, above them. And and so, you know, sometimes the front page editors would think of the story to do and they would want you to go out and prove that it's true and then go write it. And, uh, oh. and you know, that's, that tended to be the opposite direction of really, you, you know, what you should be doing, which is going out and finding the story and then coming back with it. Right. right. Um, and, and so this, this kind of preconceived notion of what video games were was often an obstacle to the kind of story that I, I wanted to write a lot. And so eventually got, you know, got a little tired of that and uh, <laughs> joined uh, Matt Marshall when he was starting a, a tech blog uh, called VentureBeat um, right. 15 years ago. And, you know, suddenly found it like, basically I had no editors, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, had to, you know, uh, uh, do these stories on the fly, post them. If there was something to fix, I'd fix them later, right? Um, and uh, uh, and yet there was a, a lot of freedom then to decide uh, what uh, what I could write and what I should pursue. And um, it was good to have all the discipline of journalism working for the, the newspapers uh, because you know they um, they make sure, you know they they pound on you to make sure to get it right. Yeah. Um, even if you're writing a speculative story about like, you know, Microsoft might be launching a, a game console, right? You had to be uh, uh, pretty careful um, uh, getting all the facts and running down anonymous sources and things like that. So, um, so it became more uh, interesting, more uh, fun to sort of be more self-directed and going out and deciding this is what, uh, uh, 
was needed. And, you know, we eventually built up some infrastructure uh, where, uh, you know, we do have our stories edited, right? And so uh, I think in, in that sense, you know, uh, blogs, tech blogs, news blogs were a, a good, you know, response to the internet and uh, they enabled us to move as fast at, at internet speed. Yeah, And uh, I think that helped me survive uh, the shrinking of the newspaper industry, really, where, you know, I felt like it was a bigger risk to stay in a large 300 person newspaper company uh, than it was to go off and join a, a five person tech ball. And, and that, yeah. sounds, that sounds interesting when you say it out loud, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, there's much more stability yeah. with these five guys. Than... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and it, it worked out. I mean, a lot of uh, 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 journalism has been constantly downsizing ever since. Yeah. And then uh, you know, we've, we've seen the rise of influencers and creators uh, who uh, have taken uh, the place of a lot of those uh, sort of tastemakers. Really. Now, you mentioned the, the discipline in traditional journalism, which is something I see lacking with a lot of influencers certainly there are some really great ones that do things like you know the right way but a lot of them are doing it for for their own fame for their own fun and and not really informing the audience and not really being responsible i mean is that and that doesn't apply to just video games that just seems like the media in general is this a problem with how people get information are people does it lead to more misinformation these days? I mean, I, I, I do think that uh, if, you, if you have the wrong business model, uh, it does motivate you in, in the wrong ways sometimes. Mm, so yes. Like one of the problems of, of journalism or uh, even uh, ad-supported news on, on, online uh, is that you have to chase after the audience and you have to... Uh, Get as many clicks as possible, as many people reading your story as you want, as you, you know, and and that leads to sensationalism, and so um, uh, you know, stretching the truth or you know, coming up with a deceptive headline, somehow trying to uh, fool the reader into thinking that what they what they've got is is really more important than, than it is, and um, uh, we we didn't have to go that route. I mean, we we did uh, uh, count on a lot of uh, traffic coming in. Uh, but, you know, the, the problem with the internet is, is that your traffic can grow and grow and grow, but the ad rates can drop and drop and drop. <laughs> <laughs> so as you have more competition out there from all kinds of, you know, websites. Uh, and, and so you're kind of running in place and it's not a good business model. And we see that even today with a lot of, uh, companies even further cutting back on, um, on their staffs right now. Uh, and, you know, we, we did come up with a different uh, model in addition to that, uh, which was um, running conferences, right? And so right. Um, we, we had the connections with a lot of, uh, say, the interesting game executives and game developers, and uh, we used that to start doing our own game conferences and have um, have them produce some of the, some of the news at our events as, as well but uh, also to to try to get into deeper conversations with them and more interesting really solid business and technology stories as opposed to uh, anything that was uh, really sort of overhyping a story and so so we weren't as motivated to get traffic uh, as we were to get the right kinds of readers uh, who uh, uh, could uh, come to our conferences and speak, and and we monetize those conferences, um, and and so I think that turned out to be the the, the winning model at the moment, um, and I think I think the models are still going to be subject to change. I mean, there's all kinds of things yeah friction as well, but uh, but you know it helped us get this far at least and, uh, and stay alive. And so one of the problems is that all of my peers lost their jobs in the <laughs> industry and they didn't, you know, they went to go work for other uh, related uh, things like, uh, you know, doing PR for game companies. Right. Right. So, now you mentioned you were talking about your games beat conferences and 
I, I just said you're kind of underselling it. I just want to, the people out there that aren't familiar with games, we, the people that speak at these events, they're, they're the heavy hitters. These are really high level executives and, and game designers. They're pretty amazing events that we get all these people in a room. It's pretty fantastic. Um, yeah. I'm glad you guys found, found that model and that it worked for you and that you're having these events. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it has come a long way and, and we, we like to, um, you know, talk about the trends that matter uh, to a lot of people in, in the industry, but also eventually matter to the gamers as well, right? Right. So one of our speakers at our, our upcoming May 22, uh, 23 conference is Robert Kirkman, and he's the creator of The Walking Dead. And, um, you, you know, what, what better person to ask about how to, how to, uh, make a franchise uh, wow. last a long time and yeah. to exploit exploit it uh, for not only movies and television but for video games and mobile games uh, as well. And don't forget the comics. I'm still yeah. still a comic yeah. book yeah. guy, very much so. Yeah. Now, Dean, I've seen you at dozens of video game events o over the like, decades. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, now I feel old. <laughs> <laughs> You were one of the few mainstream reporters there, almost always surrounded by a bunch of enthusiast press. Did how how did that feel when you were attending those events? Or did you ever feel like wow, surrounded by all these idiots? No, I I, I often felt um, like like a lot of the video game press was was there just to see the gameplay and to, to talk about it too, and um, I, I would often be there for for other reasons on top of that, which would be like, you know, what's, what's your business plan? Or, right. Uh, tell me about, you know, sort of what it's like to, to build these games, how hard it is to do and how much money it takes. And all that. And so uh, I would have different questions from everybody else who was yeah. showing up, like, especially if there was like a group press, uh, press conference, I think, but, um, but it was also interesting, you know, like uh, to to see how, um, you know, there's um, there's a contrast between people who are interested in those business stories uh, and those who want to play as much as they can, and uh, that came back to haunt me uh, when uh, I did the. Um, preview of the Cuphead game. Cuphead, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I. Uh, barely knew how to play platformers because I'm uh, much more of a first-person shooter and strategy player. Uh, and I go into this game cold, and it's uh, not easy. It's a hard game. It's a really <laughs> difficult game. And so then uh, I struggle just to get past. Uh, you know, I can't even get past the first level. And uh, and so then I came back from that preview event. Um, you know, where they just sort of threw me in cold into it, right. uh, and I played the game for 30 minutes. Uh, and I asked my my colleagues, like, "Wow, I did really terrible playing this game. Um, uh, do you you guys think that this video is usable at all that I recorded of it?" And uh, and they were joking around. They said, "Oh, it'll be good for some laughs." And so, uh, why don't you just post it? So I said, "Okay, I'll post it." And so I posted my video uh, of me playing atrociously bad uh, uh, Cuphead. And even saying that in the post, but uh, but then uh, then it, it sort of took on um, uh, sort of a, a, a darker turn. It uh, did. When, yeah, when one of the um, shit posters <laughs> yeah. out there grabbed it and said, "Like this is proof that game journalists uh, hate games or don't know how to play games, and that uh, you know uh, they just have no business uh, being." gatekeepers uh, for the media and it was sort of consistent with a lot of the the pro gamer gate uh, point of view yeah and uh and so that that video went viral and uh wow it was like an education for me <laughs> like you know what gamers uh, think of the, the privileged privileged class of uh game journalists to be fair, th that was one of the moments where I was actually proud of the enthusiast press for a lot of them came to your to your side and defended you to be like, look, this is one of the best reporters out there. He covers, he's not like a review preview guy. He covers the business of gaming. So I don't know what you guys want for him to be acing Cuphead. It's a hard game. So I, I was proud that you had a lot of 
defenders there, both professionally and personally. Yeah, so that, it was that a good was, feeling. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, it's uh, it's sad to have that be the number one thing that people find out about me when they search for me on the internet. And it uh, <laughs> should it should be your dancing. That's what it, that's what it should be. Now you were known for many days for posting double digit articles. I, I see you like wrote 18 articles today, posted 21 articles today, which is mm-hmm. astounding for, yeah. for the quality and quantity. Have you been using AI assistance? Do you fear AI replacing you one day? <laughs> well, um, I think there's, there's very different schools of thought about how often you should post. Like there are investigative journalists out there who will post, uh, you know, four stories a year maybe, and they'd be yeah. very hard hitting, um, stories that you didn't find anywhere else that were based on months of reporting. And uh, once in a while, I get to do that, like, you know, just uh, probably a few times uh, while working at VentureBeat. But quite often, I'm more interested in uh, in covering the news of the day. Uh, And um, whatever that news is, um, I go ahead and and go for it. Um, And that means that quite often, a lot of the you know story counts for the day will add up to ten stories or something like that. Um, but I also um, you know I I also value sort of uh, advanced preparation and being able to take some time with stories. And so um, you know we get a lot of news uh, pitched to us, and um, right. I ask them to pitch us you know a couple of weeks ahead of time of when the actual news happens. And we can hold on to the embargo uh, the you know, uh, publishing it at a, a later time uh, after we get, you know, the information. And so that, uh, those embargoed briefings um, help me uh, line up a lot more stories to run at certain days and certain times. And so then it looks, you know, it's a little deceptive. It looks like I've published 10 stories in a day when in fact I wrote those stories over the last week. Right. Um, but yeah, it is a constant treadmill. And I like to stay on top of certain things. Like um, I, I once when a company, a game company, gets funding uh, uh, as a startup, uh, I almost always like to write about it. Um, and that's the beginning of, of longer term relationships that I have with these companies because right. you know, in a lot of cases, nobody else is going to write about them. Right? There aren't that many game business publications out there, uh, and um, quite often, you know somebody can have a story like that and it's a big deal for their company and they raise money but nobody wants to write about it. um and you know sadly i can't write about everyone but i try right. um and eventually those companies become big companies like as if they're lucky um so you know one example of that is is uh zynga right and zynga became they went public they became a uh valuable company uh take two eventually bought them for 12 billion $12.7 billion, right? And uh, I wrote about them when they were, were young. Um, right. And, you know, the, the CEOs remember that. They continue to feed me stories, I guess, even when they're big companies because they uh, had that relationship start when they were just the tiniest company. Right. One example of that is uh, NVIDIA. Like I wrote the very first story on NVIDIA back in 1997 or so when there were something like 70 or so graphics chip companies trying to become, <laughs> you know, the best at 3D graphics. And, uh, and now they're, now they're, uh, you know, two basically, <laughs> right? Worth hundreds of billions yeah. of dollars. <laughs> yeah. Uh, their, their, their company size is pretty astounding. So one of a few left. Yeah. Now I will get you out of here on this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you're an inspiration to video game journalists and I hope you keep inspiring Asian Americans to pursue this type of career. Is there any advice you would give to young Asian Americans that are interested in pursuing a career in video game journalism? Well, you you may not want to chase uh, the last generation's goals. Like I, I mentioned some of my goals and, um, you know, uh, uh, trying to be like, I, I think I want, really wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I never realized that I could become a foreign correspondent by covering video games. Uh, but that's true because I've gone around the world uh, going to video game events. But um, uh, I, I think 
the writing is on the wall for uh, things like using new kinds of media, uh, like uh, uh, you know, uh, video, YouTube, uh, Twitch, live streaming, telling stories, but in uh, just a, a more uh, sort of uh, electrifying way for people, I guess, right? And something that grabs their attention. Um, and uh, I think uh, what's interesting about video games is that people are constantly creating their own career careers. And esports, you know, as a, as a job, right. it didn't exist 15 years ago. Right. right. Dennis, Dennis Fong was like the only guy. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I, I think creators are in, in the same boat, uh, streamers, um, cosplayers, right? Uh, yeah, there, why not? There are all kinds of careers that have been started. Uh, that have turned some people into, to, you know, millionaires or multimillionaires, uh, and um, and and they had to sort of take the initiative to invent that career because it, it really uh, you know didn't have any shape before. And you know we have a new technology upon us now, as you mentioned, with generative AI and things like ChatGPT. And no, I'm not using them to actually write my stories for myself. <laughs> uh, but I can imagine the day when I when I say, hey. Write, write me up 10 stories of the day that uh, I could write right now. And um, I pick the one or two that actually turn out to be the best and are, are say that it's written by AI, but I put my own sort of touch on it and right. make it my own and then uh, get stories out more, more quickly in a more timely way to serve readers, but still have the same, say, context or perspective added to it. Uh, I think... Um, you have to embrace some of these technologies and not not try to sort of stand in their way. I think and so. That's the advice I'd have for anybody you know thinking about uh, moving into say video game journalism, uh, or you know, uh, into the game industry where you know realizing that you have to have uh, uh, some core skills uh, to to make these games, but also stay up with the fact that things like user generated content and uh, generative AI are rapidly changing the business. You know what, Dean, I lied. I actually have one more question for you. <laughs> Before we were talking about Watergate, all the president's men. Mm -hmm. Now, if there was a, a movie about the video game business, who would you want to play Dean Takahashi and why? <laughs> Dean Takahashi. Uh, well, I don't know. Um, let's see. Um, uh, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the character would possibly be something a bit like Columbo, right? The <laughs> old detective in the, uh, in the trench coat uh, saying, oh, oh, I have one more question. I don't understand, uh, you know. <laughs> right. So, so maybe Peter Falk, or <laughs> the Asian Peter Falk, whatever the. Uh, How about, uh, let's, go, let's go with Ken Watanabe. <laughs> he, could, he, could, he could play you just get a wig on him glasses i think yeah. we're good to go yeah but there is one question i always ask almost after every single interview that i do and that is do you have anything else to say because uh, i i don't always want to have a preconceived notion of a story that i'm going in to ask questions about and if i haven't mm -hmm. asked the right questions then um, sometimes that that question gets me surprising answers, uh, and uh, that's what I, I love about uh, storytelling and journalism is that you know in a lot of ways I feel like I'm there to tell somebody else's story really. Yes, and you know that's the important thing, and so asking that question helps sort of put the agency around the story back in the right hands. Can I try it out? Yeah. Dean, do you have anything else to say? <laughs> oh, let's see. That's a good. Um, well, I bring up an example of some of the things that we've done, say, with recruiting speakers for conferences. And okay. in the in the past, um, I would go for all the CEOs and uh, uh, just automatically sort of go for the biggest possible. Uh, uh, well-known speakers. Um, and, you know, given the demographic makeup of the, the game industry, I, I would wind up with mostly white male speakers. Uh, right. And often that companies uh, that uh, were publicly held and had 
rules about what they could say. And so they were hamstrung as far as like what kind of really good stories they could tell. And so, you know, they, they, they'd have talking points and they'd be trained by PR people to say certain things. And so uh, those speakers always, you know, they, they weren't always the most compelling people. Uh, and then when I thought about it more and got advice from other people, uh, they said, well, go, go after the people who are storytellers, right? It doesn't uh-huh. matter who they are and where they come from. Go after the people who can tell a good story. And so we wind up with interesting people like Luo Mayan, um, that, you know, somebody that Jeff Keeley came upon first, but um, he, you know, he spent the first 22 years of his life in a refugee camp in Uganda and uh, eventually uh, you know, escaped and, or, you know, got out of there and uh, was able to, you know, work on a video game, right? Uh, and then uh, Teresa Duringer was another where um, she was showing me a demo of her game uh, uh, at a, you know, at a game jam type event. And then she mentioned that, oh, my mother was a game developer. Right? And then oh. I had to stop and think about that and go, um, you know, given how young this industry is, uh, yeah, how and how how male it was in the very beginning, um, uh, how could that happen? <laughs> and like, how many people have that kind of background? Yeah, so I talked to her more about that, and that became a very interesting story. And um, you know, she was kind of like a unicorn status by the fact that you know, she's probably one of the only second generation game developers out there. Um, I actually found a, a person more recently who was the, uh, a granddaughter of a game developer, which was wow. even more freaky, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's like, you know, you don't always have to have a preconceived idea of the story that you're looking for. Love it. And thank you so much, Dean, for hanging out with me and for inspiring the people out there. If you want to follow Dean, His Twitter is D-E-A-N-T-A-K. Always has excellent stories. Uh, Check him out on GamesBeat. And we will see you next time on RPAD TV. Thanks for watching.